Hello and welcome back to Post Sports Live. I am your host, Jonathan Forsyth, and joining us in the TV studios of the, uh, Post TV are LeVar Arrington, Brandon Parker, and Dan Sniper of the Sports Blog. Happy Tuesday, guys. Hello. My, Thank how you. a week has changed the outlook for our Wizards. Just one week ago, bit. I was asking you guys if the series was over after one game, <laughs> and the Wizards haven't won since. I said it was, I think. <laughs> you said it was, depending on if Hibbert continued to play like he did in game one. Uh, obviously, he's woken up, and so is Paul George and the rest of the team. We've got a lot to talk about. We'll lead with Game 5, uh, the Wizards on the brink of elimination in Indiana tonight. We'll give some bold predictions. We'll also talk about expectations, regardless of how this series plays out, for next year for the Wizards. What has this run done for them? Obviously, they have some free agents, some big free agency uh, decisions to make in the offseason, but we'll talk about what, their ex what your guys' expectations are for 2015 for the Wizards. Um, we're going to talk about the Redskins draft hall. we got Mike Jones joining us this morning. Um, to break down uh, their eight draft picks and, and who he thinks can make the biggest impact um, this season with the, with the Redskins, even though their strategy was sort of more for the future, even beyond this one year. Uh, and then finally, we'll wrap up with the Nationals guys and a tough series in Oakland. They, they won a big game in Arizona, and Matt Williams returned to Arizona yesterday, and we'll talk about their fielding woes and if they can actually realistically compete for the NL East crown, continuing to field as poorly as they have. Um, so let's start with game five. Mr. Steinberg, give me some bold predictions after two tough games in Washington over the weekend. You know, I've been wrong pretty much every step of the way on this particular <laughs> series. So I don't know that my bold prediction is going to matter much. I, I do think that the Wizards are going to lose tonight, which is certainly not bold. Here's the thing that I'm going to give you that's the boldest thing I got. I think John Wall is going to outscore Paul George tonight. All right. Um, Wall has struggled to look crazy in this series, right. especially in that last game. And you know, I think there's, it's fair to wonder, is, is he kind of packing it in for the season? Not, not that he's not going to try, obviously, but that is he sort of giving up a little bit on his own offensive game. I think he comes out and he scores tonight. I think that the Pacers have enough without Paul George. I don't think Paul George is doing 39 points again. So I think Wallow scores George. All right, give me something, Brandon. What do you got? Um, just want to say, remember last year, when, last week, when I said there are things to work on, you guys looked at me like I was crazy. Now we, did, right. <laughs> you now did. we right. see. Oh, you were right. pointing out now the negatives. That's, that's right. That's right. Little things. But... <laughs> you are right. um, I think it's still going seven. I Whoa. think. All right. I think it's. I think the Wizards. Obviously, they play better on the road. They have. They win tonight. Them. Then they finally get it together at home. I. S I don't think they're going to win the series, but I I'm saying it's it's going seven. So you got a Wizards win tonight as your bold prediction. Yeah. All right. Lavar, beat that. He kind of looks like Otto Porter, doesn't he? <laughs> There's a little Otto Porter. Right? I see that. No, no. See, now, if I was lighter than you, that might be right. true. But I might, anyway, that's inside deal. Yeah, um, yeah. I'm going with I'm going with less than six turnovers from the Washington Wizards. Wow. I, I think that turnovers has been their Achilles' heel, mm -hmm. and poor shooting by uh, guys like John has has really put them if if John makes three more of his his you know of his shots they win that game if you really think about it so I I, I also look at the amount of turnovers has has really I mean they had like nine turnovers uh, between like John Wall and or and Gortat, I believe mm -hmm. uh, had a tough game. And, and, and then the Pacers had less than five I believe as an entire team and I think that that plays a major part. So I'll say my bold prediction is they will win this game, uh, and and the, the the turnovers will be less than let's say you did I say five or six? Too? I think the Wizards are going to win. Two predictions tonight. for Wizards win. Wow. I think right. they'll win. I'm going to go. Uh, I'm going to go one up on yours, Dan, and and not only say that John Wall scores well, but I think he goes for a triple double tonight. Answers all the critics wow. that have been triple banging double. on him about struggling this series. Do you have the Wizards winning, winning folks. I do think they win game if five. He, but if he does triple double, they. I think I think a big yeah. game from John Wall, and all of a sudden, all the you know the the languages about how the Wizards got the mojo back be, behind John Wall, their franchise player point guard. But we'll see. You know, I'm he's amazed. got a long I way to that go. The whole point of the show is to just react dramatically to the last thing that happened. In life. <laughs> <laughs> so it seems we're like taking it a different good. approach now. <laughs> yeah. But oh. he, here's a here's a quick question. I want to add a minute to this, if we could, for the producers. And Brandon, give me. Um, do you think that it's actually an advantage for the Wizards to be on the road in this elimination game, considering how they've played at home? It, it seems to be. I mean, I, I still can't believe they lost that game on Sunday. I mean, obviously they, they feed off the in energy at home, but maybe, you know, not having that there, they have to draw something more within themselves on mm -hmm. the road. I mean, I, I, I can't really explain it, and I'm sure they couldn't either. But, yeah, you would think 
just looking at the, the stat sheet that, yeah, it's going to be. It could be a level of comfort. It, it could be the, the routine of the day is different. You know, basketball has a looser environment than, than some other, other sports. Like those guys, that, you know, I, I do believe they stay in the hotel, but, I mean, how long do they stay in the hotel for? Like mm -hmm. you're free for this amount of time, then you have to show up to the shoot around and stuff like that, if I recall the schedule yeah. correctly. Yeah. So when you're out of town, you're in the hotel, and even though they have free time, when they're out of time as well, out of town as well, it's just not as it's not as comfortable a deal, you know, having your car, your people, mm -hmm. your built-in people, all those different things that you have when you're at home. It's a different level of comfort. And, and real quick, I think it reminds them of their underdog status because everybody mm -hmm. outside of here is the same wizards, bandwagon. We love them, but on the road, everybody hates you. That's right, and they, they're four and one so far yeah. uh, on the road in the playoffs. We'll see if that can continue tonight in Indiana. Um, Dan, I want to ask you about your expectations for this team um, for next year. And I want, to, I want to quote a line from our good buddy and colleague, Mike Wise, who wrote in a, in a column either yesterday or today, there's a harsh realization that the Wizards are not ready to take the gigantic step from playoff team to serious contender. And he was comparing how, how much things have changed in the course of a week, where they had the 1-0 series lead, and now losing three straight, it's sort of coming maybe a little bit more clear that this team still has a long way to go. Would you agree with that? I mean, it's hard to disagree right now. I think the, the problem is that what they did against Chicago, and it's hard to know if that was because of the Wizards or because of Chicago, but what they did in that series now has sort of completely revamped what everyone expects going forward, I think. And so, you know, a month ago, if you had said, hey, this team's going to make it to the second round and, and bow out to the top seed in the East, people would have thought, that's, that's tremendous, that's fantastic. All season we were sort of saying the benchmark should be winning a first-round series, and they did that, and yet somehow it feels not satisfying. It feels like they sort of have missed an opportunity here because, you know, Atlanta was up 3-2 on the Pacers. The Wizards had cruised. The Pacers looked in disarray. And it seemed like, hey, why shouldn't they go to the Eastern Conference Finals? And they play well against Miami. Why shouldn't they have a chance to go to the NBA Finals? <laughs> I mean, that didn't seem crazy. So I think that all of our expectations, expectations have been so recalibrated that now this almost will feel like a disappointment if they can't make it past it. Yeah. Which, but, but, yeah. but it makes it an unfair statement, what, what Dan just said. But pitch it ahead to next year. What are your expectations, regardless of how this series ends? What are your expectations for next well, year? Again, I, I, basing it off of what they've done this year and, and them being able to do as much as they've done, I think the expectation is to get some of those core guys re-signed. I think you got to get Gortat back. I think you got to do what you need to do to get Ariza back on this team, even if you think that Otto Porter is the answer. I still think that I think that Trevor Ariza has earned his right to be on this team. And and I don't know if it was Dan that said it. Somebody said when Larry Hughes left Gilbert Arenas, things were never quite the same with the chemistry of this team. I think they've developed a chemistry where they trust Ariza, where Ariza isn't afraid to to take the shots or do the things that he does for this team. I think he led the team in rebounds. Like, he's such a utility guy mm -hmm. for this team. I think moving forward, you have to build around the guys that have shown to be good Washington Wizards players and continue to find other guys moving forward. But to say that they're not ready to take that big step into being an uh, ultimate contender, I, I think it's an unfair statement. Brandon, would you – I mean, would Dan – articulated earlier about the expectations this year with a weak Eastern Conference winning a first round of a playoffs were the expectation. Mm -hmm. I would argue that it was just making the playoffs despite Absolutely. given the recent history. Yeah. But what is it next year? Is it, I mean, is it the same thing? Is it winning a playoff series next year or is it even more? Well, yeah, they won once. So I feel like it has to be even more. I mean, do they have a long way to go to be a championship contender? Yes. But um, like, like LeVar said, I think this offseason will – dictate what's going to happen. You, you definitely have to bring back Gortat. You're not going to find many centers, even though he's, he's struggled in the playoffs. Ariza, that's the, I, I don't, from what Michael Lee tells me, I don't know if they can keep both of them because Ariza's going to get paid <laughs> regardless. Right. So, um, yeah, do you keep Otto Porter and say he's the guy of the future, or do you bank on Ariza coming back even stronger? But, yes, they, they do have to do better next year. You got Porter waiting in the wings. You know, I think the other thing, just briefly, is that if they don't win at least the same, go at least as far next year as they did this year, 
you know, people are going to flash right back to that Arenas team you were talking about, where the first year they made the playoffs with Arenas and Larry Hughes, they won the first round they series, the Bulls, right? and then they never were able to do it again, and then everything fell apart, and they became one of the worst teams in the and league. They got to be careful of that because I'm sorry, right now I don't I don't see Otto Porter, the player that he is, how his game is. Do you see him coming in and being that that piece of the puzzle that Trevor Ariza has been? That, they kept, run, they kept running shot, into though. LeBron. And, yeah, sure you do. And this team has a younger backcourt with, with with a huge upside, you would think, is going to be a little bit I think bit but one of those years they ran into LeBron was like a 4-5 or five seed game. I mean, it's yeah, like, he you've got to be one of the four best Cleveland, teams in the Eastern yeah. Conference. Yeah. That's what you have to do. LeBron's right. still there. Do Let's you give, just, Otto, Miami. Do you give Otto Porter <laughs> that Do you give Otto Porter that chance without Trevor Ariza being on this team. I mean, you yeah. got sort of you might have to. That's the way you give him a chance. You might have to. You might have to. He's number three pick. Yeah, All right, let's move on, guys. Let's move on to the uh, Redskins. And obviously, the draft happened over the weekend. Uh, Redskins made some moves. They traded down from their uh, 34th spot um, to get an extra third rounder. We caught up with Mike Jones, Redskins beat writer, this morning for a one on one. Let's get his thoughts on the Redskins draft hall. Joining me now via Skype is Redskins beat writer Mike Jones. And, Mike, welcome back to Post Sports Live. Hey, thanks for having me. Hey, Mike, obviously we're going to talk about the draft, and I want to get your top level sort of what stood out to you and surprised you about the Redskins draft strategy. Well, they they stayed true to their plan. Bruce Allen had said it the days leading up that they were going to make moves with an eye on 2015 and 2016, um, and you didn't know if they were actually really – thinking that way or if they were going to try to make a move into the first round and uh, almost like a desperation move, but they did not. Every single pick that they made uh, was basically looking to improve depth at positions, not really looking for someone to uh, make a big splash and immediate impact, but guys that they could develop into players for their long-term needs. Their first pick, in the second round, Trent Murphy, obviously they traded the pick back, dropped down to get Trent Murphy. Um, what does that selection mean for Brian Arakpo's future with the team? I don't know if it means a whole lot because if, uh, you know, the scouting report on Murphy is that he's a hardworking guy, strong, good hands, uh, but he's not very explosive. Uh, he doesn't have the motor even that uh, Ryan Kerrigan seems to have. Jay Gruden said he needs to become more explosive. He needs to get a little stronger. So he's almost more like a project type of guy, a guy they can put in there in situations this year just to help pass rushing. I don't know that he is the level of player that you want to be a replacement for Brian Arakpo down the road if they can't get something done. Now, does it mean that they think that eventually he can be the sidekick and they could slide Kerrigan over to that other side if they could not uh, re-sign Arakpo? Possibly. But for right now, I don't know if you can put a whole lot of you know stock into what this means for Arakpo. Do you expect to see many sets this year with Kerrigan, Arakpo, and Murphy on the field at the same time? Yeah, I think so, because Jim Hazlitt wanted to do a lot of that. During training camp, we saw a lot of Brandon Jenkins, uh, Kerrigan, and Arakpo. Sometimes it was Rob Jackson, and things just didn't really pan out in the season. Uh, Jim Hazlitt's going to take advantage of having them, and he'll find packages so he can do that. Of the eight draft picks, Mike, which of them do you expect to possibly start this season? and or significantly contribute this year? The guy who's got the best chance of starting would be right tackle Morgan Moses out of UVA. Uh, this is a guy who had a late first round, early second round grade. He ended up sliding down to the third round where the Redskins were able to get him. So that's pretty good value. Uh, I liked what I saw out of him when uh, the week at Senior Bowl practices where he was really showed good mobility. Um, you know, he's got to get a little bit stronger, but they really like what they have in him. He's going to compete with Tyler Columbus for that right uh, tackle starting job. The other guys, I'm not so sure that we will see any of them start. Um, I think the cornerback out of Clemson, Bashad Breland, that they got in the fourth round, he's going to be used a lot on special teams. Some of these other guys, they made sure that these were guys who do well in special teams. The tight end that they got out of Indiana, Ted Bolzer. Uh, Jay Gruden talked about that as one of his attributes. He said that he runs down the field like a, quote, war daddy. Um, you know, so possibly him as well contributing on special teams and also some pass catching situations. And then we'll see what happens with Zach Hawker, the kicker that they took, because they do have Kai Forbath, but they really liked him enough to draft him rather than to, you know, go into uh, trying to sign him as an undrafted uh, free agent. And so he's going to compete for that kicking job. Will he beat out Forbath? I don't know because he's pretty accurate, but he does have better leg strength on kickouts. Uh, Mike, last question. What does the net gain of this draft tell us about new head coach Jay Gruden? How big of a role did he have in selecting these players? 
Well, I, I know that they wouldn't have pulled the trigger on any of them if he did not want them. This was a collective, um, you know, effort here with, uh, you know, Jay Gruden and Bruce Allen. Uh, you can tell that this regime really wants to build for the long term. They want to fortify and strengthen their depth. Uh, they know that they have to get better at building and using their draft picks. Uh, in the past, they have had not not had a lot of success with those draft picks. We've seen a lot of guys just not pan out. And Gruden has stressed that they've got to find guys that they can develop. Uh, you know, all these guys they're counting on next year or the year after that being key contributors. All right, Mike Jones, thanks for joining us. We made it through an entire segment without mentioning RG3. I can't believe that. Uh, thanks for joining us, and we'll uh, we'll see you later this season, maybe in once mini camp start up again. All right, thanks. I'll see you. Uh, thanks, Mike. All right, guys, so I want to ask a tiebreaker coming out of that, and it's based on the draft picks, and I'll use the first, the top two draft picks. And uh, obviously Mike mentioned Morgan Moses as somebody who might have an impact this year. Also, we'll throw Trent Murphy into the mix. And the question to you, Brandon, is which 2014 draft pick will have the biggest impact for the rest of this season, Trent Murphy or Morgan Moses? I got to go with Trent Murphy. Um, I think – he, he, I think at Stanford he played in that hybrid 3-4 formation, which pretty much somewhat fits what Jim Hazlitt does on defense. So I feel like he gives them another guy that they can shuffle through along with Arakpo and, and Kerrigan and guys like that. So I always say this, you know, transition from college to pro, you don't know how it's going to work. I know he had like 15 sacks at the college level. Mm -hmm. but. That means he's aggressive. That means he's familiar, again, with the scheme that they have. So I feel like he could be the guy this year. And you just expect the top draft pick to have right. the biggest impact yeah. just from a simple standpoint. Dan, give me the other side. I'd say, Moses, first of all, you say he is the top draft pick. The rest can suck, which is true. But like Mike pointed out in that segment, I think a lot of the experts, so-called experts, had Moses as a higher-rated prospect than Murphy to begin with. So I think that's kind of a wash. I, I just look at need, and I think that – Last week here, I said, if it were me, the first pick I would take would be someone who could bolster the right side of that offensive line. They got a guy who seemingly can do that with the, the issues that they've had there for years and years with the need to protect RG3. With Moses' massive size and talent, I think he's a guy that could be starting at some point. And with the guys that are ahead of Murphy, I think that would be hard for him to do. So I would say Moses. Redskins great LeVar Arrington. Break the tie, please. Uh, I think I'm going to go with Morgan Moses as well. I, I think for no other reason than he has to be the, the largest contributor. I, I, I don't see this offensive line not being what it needs to be if they can't shore up the right side. It, it, it seemed to be uh, the clear weakness of this offensive line last year. So if he can come in and, and bring uh, a, a form of physicality and, and, and anchor that, that right side, I mean, with all the weapons that they have, it, it, it should make a tremendous difference for this, this offensive unit. All right, sorry, Brandon, you lose that one. Sorry. Uh, sorry since we have an extra minute, and I'm not going to go the grades <laughs> route, but were you, guys, were you guys surprised that out of eight total draft picks, they only had two on the defensive side of the ball, LeVar? Well, I was glad that they took offensive linemen. Mm -hmm. The fact that they took two offensive linemen was good. They, they did draft the corner. Mm -hmm. they, they, they did draft the pass rusher. I think a lot of these guys really, again, I think so many times we lose sight of the fact that there are three phases to the game and everybody focuses in on offense and defense. But I really think that what made their draft impactful is that they drafted all guys, in my opinion, that can either start for offense or defense, but ultimately all of them can play some type of role on special teams. I think Murphy makes the special teams much better. The kid that, that they say RG3 talked them into bringing in uh, from Baylor, uh, the speed that the kid has. What, what's his C name? C-Strunk. C-Strunk. I, I yeah. think that. Never caught a pass out of that. He's someone, he's someone that can help you on special teams. Right. So I think that that's what they really were focusing in on because that was one of their major weaknesses as well. Hey, give me one extra minute on this since we're talking the Redskins. And, Dan, you mentioned – um, Breland as somebody who you thought might have a big impact this year, you know, maybe nickel coverage or, or special teams or both. Yeah, someone, again, another guy who's super talented who maybe fell down a little bit because of some off the field concerns, I guess. Um, you know, I don't break down tapes of fourth round <laughs> cornerbacks from Clemson or whatever, but certainly from what the experts are saying about this guy, he's a guy that had higher talent and the defensive secondary is an area of massive weakness. A lot of those safeties that we'd heard about were all gone way before the Redskins were picking, but cornerback, I, 
there are there are issues with the cornerback on this roster, and obviously NFL teams nowadays are using three and four cornerbacks regularly. So I, it seems to me like there would be an opportunity for this kid to play. That you don't break down tapes. It was an interesting draft. But do you know whether the fourth round corner from Clemson shaves his armpits? <laughs> <laughs> I do so not. I'm but sure I they talked that. about it during the ten Martian million Brooks hours. Does. Of <laughs> <laughs> well, go ahead. Last last word well, on the draft. No, in I was 10 just seconds. saying it was it's an interesting draft, and for you to have a successful draft, which I think you could deem the Redskins a successful draft, it was just so many players in so many different positions that it truly was a real draft this year. You saw a real draft take place. And like Mike said, they're building for not just next year, but beyond. So we'll see how that works out for the Redskins this time around. All right, uh, let's move on to the Nationals, guys. And my goodness, a tough series over the weekend in Oakland. They got swept away. They were outscored by 17 runs. They committed five errors, blew a save. I mean, I don't think too many things could have gone much worse for the Nats, but they bounced back uh, Monday night in Arizona. Uh, coming back late, and even though it was interesting, uh, they were able to get the save eventually from Soriano in the ninth, despite the fact that he gave up a couple hits. Um, the question here is, is on those errors, Dan, and I'm going to start with you. Um, can the Nats realistically win the National League East? And they're just in second place. They're 20 and 18. They're over 500 still. Can they realistically win the division, continuing to be one of the worst fielding teams in the majors? They have the third most errors in the league right now. You know, I'd, I could get our, our guy Neil Greenberg to do historical research on whether any team has done that. I, I would suspect that they could be one of the worst teams and still win the division. Maybe not the second worst or the worst the way they have been so far. You know, obviously they're still playing with kind of a shorthand right now. They've got so many guys that have been injured. Um, the pitching staff has mostly been healthy, but just so many key contributors on the offense have been gone. And so you sort of have to be perfect in other areas when you're operating as such a weakness, and they clearly haven't at many areas, including the defense. But, you know, I, like you said, they're still kind of right in there. And before that Oakland series, I think they were in first place in the mm -hmm. division. So I don't, know that, I don't know that there's anything about the team that I would be panicking about right now other than they just haven't seemed to be particularly crisp doing anything. But, again, it's just so early and it's such a long season, and they're still winning games. Brandon, any, any red flags there for you, or do you sort of agree with Dan, still too early to get too worried about it? Yeah, I mean, yes and no. It, it is early, <laughs> but, you know, it seems like each week we keep talking about the injuries and, you know, give them some time. There's only so much time in the season, so, yes, there's, there's, there's room for when Harper and Zimmerman and them come back to, to get better. But, I mean, they're, what, they're only 15th in hitting, so if you're making all these errors, you're giving the other team opportunities, more outs. Right. That means you're going to have to shore up your bats. So I'd say you don't panic, but... I think it'd be very hard, even though they're hanging on for second place now, it'd be very hard to be the worst fielding team and, and be in the playoffs. LeVar, your thoughts on the Nats and their, uh, their fielding issues? I don't issues? think you can overlook it, and I don't think they can win it with, with all those mistakes and, and those errors. Um, if you look at what they've done historically and even this year, they're not beating the good teams. They're not winning the series against competitive teams. Right. And, and I think that when you talk about the defensive errors that are taking place with this team, uh, you always talk about, even in football terms, you want to win the battle of the turnovers and different things like that. Uh, you want to be on the top of the plus, plus uh, you know, negative ratio of things that are going on. If you're going to be an elite team, those are things that you have to you have to execute at a higher level than what they are right now. So they'll beat the teams that aren't good enough to overcome their pitching staff, or you know, they may be able to to like like Brandon said, shore up their their bats and be able to to get get runs. But if you're playing against elite teams, you can't play defense that way and expect to be able to win it. So I can't see them being better than Atlanta. Mm -hmm. um, to win it if they can't do any better than that. You know, the other thing, I was going to say, uh, Matt Williams had such a focus on kind of doing everything correctly, doing all the little things, working harder in spring training. He even had like a defensive consultant. Defensive coordinator, yeah. Defensive coordinator. You know, I, to me it sort of goes to show that a lot of that stuff is overrated. Fans are always saying, oh, you know, put, put them out there earlier before the game, do some extra infield practice. You know, <laughs> right. for some of these things, these guys have played thousands and thousands of baseball games in their lives. Either, either they're the best fielders in the world or they're like a little bit below that. It seems like the Nats guys are a little bit below that level. Well, and, and, and to your point, I did do a little bit of research before. And, oh, yeah. there, and last year the, the Dodgers won the NL West and had the sixth most errors in the league. They had the they had the 23rd best fielding percentage. So you can win a division 
and be a poor fielding team. Now, well, you know, as also, poorly also, as, as the Nats are now, maybe not, but, but they can still. And you know why? Because they're sixth in the, Nat, in the majors in the ERA. You have a pitching staff like that, and it makes up for a lot of problems. I mean, errors yeah. is also sort of a, a little bit of a debunked stat, right? Because you're only making errors if your guys are getting to the ball. So you're not really... Obviously, you're not really measuring a team's total defense by just using that error. We need to get our guy, Neil Greenberg, on the show to, to, to do some sort of like advanced, deep, deep, deep advanced chart, stats chart. analysis <laughs> on Something that. But there, the, yeah. the, good news all, the good news on the other side is that the Nationals are coming back this year, which they didn't do a lot of last year. They, have, they already have a handful of comeback victories. There you go. Which they didn't, including last night. Coming from an Orioles fan. Coming from an Orioles fan. <laughs> One of the best fielding teams. I you like that? I'll, I'll laugh. Shouts out to the Orioles. I thought this was a great show. Strings. What did you think? You, you I thought this was a great show. Some great camaraderie. A lot of great people on this no, panel. No puns intended, <laughs> of course. I don't know. I, I don't think know. you're a great blogger. Thank I you. really do. <laughs> there, this was a great show. Yes. Thank you very a much. A lot of to, greatness going on. To a, on great, here. a great group on a great cast for a great edition of Post Sports Live. Just great. <laughs> Thanks to Mr. Steinberg. You guys have a great day out Mr. there. Mr. Parker <laughs> and Redskins great LeVar Arrington. Thanks oh, for joining geez. us on Post Sports Live. We'll see you next week. So you're gonna same get place, same time. <laughs> <laughs> Don't say that on your show.